The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report, part two of the Super Bowl Thursday pod. We do not have him on the Subway Fresh Deck hotline. He's in studio. (laughs) ESPN's Trent Dilfer. What's happening? Hey, good to be here. I forgot to uh, mention that Joe House is here as well, my buddy. Hello. My permanent co-host for two days. For two days. Yeah. It's perfect. Um, yeah. So we were talking about, in part one, we were talking about guys going out mm-hmm. on Super Bowl week. Mm-hmm. And like Roethlisberger went out last night and went to a piano bar. And everybody said, oh, Tuesday you know, night, right? Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah whatever. Um, you were in the Super Bowl. You mm-hmm. played for the Ravens. You won a Super Bowl. Yep. Wait, is it a big deal that guys go out and let off some steam? It can't be a big deal, right? It's not a big deal. And it's it's what night, you know? It, it, the story's borderline ridiculous that, that people made such a big deal of Ben going out with his offensive linemen. I mean, I'm sure you guys talked about it. First of all, it's what they do all year long. Yeah. Um, it's a great team bonding, leadership, whatever you want to call it thing for Ben and, the, and those bigs to do. Um, he flips the bill, which gets them excited. Uh, and I think the biggest thing with this week, and I've heard some analysts talk about it, but I think it's probably the most important thing when you're dealing with this week is stay true to who you are. Stay in character. Don't try to be right. somebody you're not. Um, that's both how you handle the week and how you play on Sunday. Does that go for barbecue, too? <laughs> If, you have, if you're not a big barbecue guy, I don't have like five straight barbecue dinners. Yeah, that, that's, just keep the routine. Keep the routines. We are all creatures of habit. Uh, our, our lives are so structured in season that if you change it up too much, uh, it really throws you for a loop. So I think the general theme is be who you are, stay true to yourself, stay in character, however you want to say it. Um, and if your Tuesday night routine is going and having some cocktails or doing whatever you do, then do it. You know, some guys, it's Friday nights now. There may, we, Saturday we may be doing TV and we hear about some guys going out and having a couple beers or whatnot and people are going to make a big deal out of it. But the, the fact of the matter is in the regular season, that's what you do. I'd go out with my wife. We had date night and I had no problem. We'd share a bottle of wine on date night on a Friday night. Um, that's just what you do. You stick to those routines. You did that when you were playing? Yeah. Drunk. I know. Can you believe you that? I'm not even a drinker, but it's terrible. <laughs> but you know that I, I just I, I laugh at the whole thing. Yeah. The issue is I think it's a bigger deal. Let me tell you what a bigger deal is. If you see a guy at media day that's usually reserved and calm and poised and he's trying to put on a show. He's trying to be somebody he's not. Oh. I look at that guy and go, That guy will not play good on Sunday. Huh. And every year you kind of find a couple now this year I didn't. One reason I was flying in on Tuesday, so I didn't see a lot of media day, but Every year you see a guy and you go, I bet you he plays poorly on Sunday because he's trying to be something he's not. Yeah. He's using this as a platform to kind of announce himself to the world, and that's a bad sign. And that's something that I, I, I've i kind of avoided the hype for the most part, but the team that's been there before versus the team that hasn't been there. I mean, Pittsburgh's literally been here this twice. Is, they are the classic we've been here before. Team. Yeah, third Third time in six yeah. years, right? Yeah. And I think that's being overblown a little bit. In fact, yeah, I overblown. Uh, not uh, to be a contrarian, okay. I think it actually can hurt them, and here's why. So you've heard people talk about that. Oh, yeah. Okay, this I has haven't. been the big thing. The Steelers have, I think I saw 26 guys. That number might be a little off that were on la- the last Super Bowl team, and the Packers have two mm. that have Super Bowl experience. Um, I, I think a couple things. And now I'm going off my limited one Super Bowl experience, but I did talk to a lot of guys going into the Super Bowl, and I've talked to a lot of guys since that have played multiple Super Bowls. And the one common theme is that the guys that play best, the teams that play best, account for every minute of every day getting ready for this game. Yeah. And there is such a razor-sharp focus uh, and such an attention to being aware of your surroundings. Okay, i got to be very careful on Thursday, right? When I do Thursday of Super Bowl week, that my preparation is the same, that I go to dinner with the right people, that I don't have dead time. Am I going to rent a movie in my room? Am I going to... You know, am I going to play ping pong with the guys in the hotel lobby? What am I going to do? And you're 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 hyper paranoid about making sure you handle every situation right, so that Sunday you are emotionally, physically, uh, and mentally primed for that game. 
And that's what the Packers are doing. And that's what the Steelers probably did the first time. And they probably did it the second time as well. Oh, I but like now, where you're going. Now is it old hat? Not, it, honestly, I mean, there's guys, 26 of those guys that, eh, we've been there, done that. We know how to handle Thursday. We know how to handle Friday. We know what practice is going to be like. We know the dangers out there. So are you as sharp? Are you as focused? Are you as paranoid to make sure you do everything right? And I think the key to me every every year, the team that I always think is the best is the team that has the, the, the sharpest edge, the hardest edge to them. And I see that at the Packers. I sat with Aaron Rodgers yesterday for uh, an hour and a half, basically, and talked and did, did an interview with him. And you can tell this team has an edge to it. I mean, huh. they got a hard edge to them. We'll see with the Steelers. I, I'm I'm scared that for them that this might be old hat to a certain degree. So you're saying it's almost like dating somebody that you start <laughs> like first. Yeah, date, first I like date, that. I thought to about that. Them. You're, you're thinking it through. I'm going to do this. I got to. I want to. But by the third date, you're like, hey, let's go to the movies. I don't know. I have to tell I you, I kind of like that. As you're describing it, it sounds a little exhausting to me. The being paranoid about kind of every yep. minute and having that that uh, regimented approach to it. It sounds like by Sunday, I would be worried about being tired, that, fatigued by that. Very good point. I, I think the balance is here. It's this is why you hear guys talk about preparation. You know, the great players they always talk about their preparation, preparation, preparation. If you are anal with your preparation, if you if you cross every T, dot every I, um, you go to Sunday and you're completely free. You have no anxiety. You have no worries. You have – now, listen, I've done the other two. I haven't prepared well enough. And you go to Sunday and you're scared. You're like, oh, gosh, is there something I'm going to see that I'm not prepared for? Something going to happen. That was the bottom line of date for. night. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, blame my wife for that one. Yeah. Um, so – I think it's freeing. I think it it is fatiguing during the week. And yeah. There were many Saturdays that I just, oh my gosh, I just couldn't wait to get to the hotel room and go to bed because I had invested so much Monday through Saturday. I remember being that way super the night before the Super Bowl that I people said you have a problem sleeping. I said no, I had prepared so hard and done so many mental gymnastics. I remember at seven. I can remember looking at my alarm clock and it being I think eight thirty eight thirty something and going, gosh, I wish I could just go to bed right now. Oh. And I was so done. You so know? you're saying Pittsburgh might be more likely to have the two wide receivers. Want to play like the text? Want to play some Madden? Ah, oh, we shouldn't. It's been that. Like Come that. on, man. Uh, yes, I then do think that's a five danger. Because the they've been there. Yes, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying there's a danger of that happening. Well, now, when was your Super Bowl? It was a one weeker, right? Was no, we had two. two. Oh, we yeah, had two. two. Thank yeah. God. I don't know how these guys do it with one week. The the this when guys only get a week to prepare for this. I don't know how they do it because the first week you get all the details out of, you know all the tickets yeah. and hotel room and who's going and phone calls and you know returning phone calls whatnot so you people talk about that it really is a massive logistical undertaking for oh, each guy right huge. you got to worry you have to worry about your family or at least oh, your yeah. wife i you we were about everybody i mean we have your tickets how many yes. tickets you get every team's different i think we got 14 if i remember correctly how many people asked you for tickets we ended up Using those 14 and buying another 20. Wow. Um, and then flying out. I, I'll say this. It, 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 I lost money on the Super Bowl. You did? Yes. I lost wow. money, not just on the Super Bowl, on the whole, all the playoff checks adding up plus the Super Bowl check. That's how much money we spent on getting relatives and friends and mm. just just getting them taken care of. You know of. who won money in that Super Bowl? You did. <laughs> <laughs> the Ravens. That was one of my favorites. I can't believe the field for I Brandon Stokely first touchdown. We were oh. only one point favorites going to that game. I just saw that recently that we were one point favorites. I, you know, in it, our minds, we were thirty point favorites. You guys were great that year. The yeah. defense was phenomenal. well. That's why. ridiculous. You know what it was actually? It was because the Giants looked so good the, the, yeah. in the NFC title game that right. threw everybody off. Yeah. But yeah, you weren't gonna. That team wasn't gonna lose. What was Ray Lewis like? He was awesome on the day of. Oh, the day. You was know, he funny, like, is it, were his eyes like bright red, like well, Terminator or something? We were very reserved that morning. I remember meetings that morning, very reserved. Um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, guys not tapping their foot or anxious uh, to the point where I remember on the bus ride over thinking to myself, are we emotional? Because we were an emotional team. Yeah. Uh, are we emotionally ready? <laughs> and it was, it was this guy started putting on their socks. And putting their pads and their football pants, and you know, get you could start seeing it build emotionally. You could see it in everybody's eyes. You know, the, the chatter around the locker room got a little bit different, and you mm-hmm. could kind of see it build to this 
climax that it was when we got on the football field. So that team was unique. Now they had we had a lot of guys that just kind of knew how to handle themselves. They Did you feel it, like I have no doubt we're going to win this game? Yeah, no doubt. I, and I try not to say it publicly too often because you feel like you're being disrespectful to the Giants. You just knew your team was that good. We were playing ping pong on the Saturday night, and it was a joke. You know, we we're joking around um, by how much we would win this game by. And it's you're kind of in a weird spot because when people talked about the Ravens, they always pointed at you as like, well, he's the guy. If, if he has a bad game, yeah. if he uh, if he, I could have thrown four interceptions, we would have won that game. Yeah, I mean that. That's go ahead, carry throw five. I just had to throw one less. <laughs> that's mean, but you know my job, and I have no pride. When people say manage the game, I, I take it as a compliment. Oh. You were the first manage the game. Guy. I was. It I started, mean, that was it like started the, with the, me. You were the. Yeah. the I, I tried to trade pioneer. I tried to trademark it. By the way, you did. Yeah, that whole thing didn't work. But yeah, I wanted to trademark it, and anytime anybody said something, I got paid for it. Didn't work. Then it was uh, Brad Johnson a couple years. Yeah. Later, and huh? who else was a manage the game? Well, I think Brady the when, first year. when Rex Grossman played in it, it was uh, if he can just manage the game, if he could just play Dill for S, they they could win the game. Yeah. I, you know, the thing is with that is that that's fine, and that's to me that's not a slap in the face. I'd always have rather been the guy that didn't lose it, you know, right. than the reason we won. Right. That was the reason we won plenty of times in college and in Tampa and all. You know, I had kind of done that. Um, I just wanted to win, and so, I knew that, that that formula was just don't don't be the reason we lose. So, what do you remember? Like, so now it's been eleven years, no, ten, ten years, ten years. So, you know, I can't remember what I did a week ago. What do you remember about that game? Now, is it just a blur? I don't have a lot of vivid memories. Um, a couple stories I tell that people like. Well, one is I talked about the emotional buildup. I handled that. I was so concerned going back to Tampa, where I just played six years. And what the visual stimulation would be when I got on the football field. I was very worried that I would get on that football field, Raymond James, and would it be an interception that I threw against the Green Bay Packers? And oh, because you played there. Right? I played there for so yeah. long. Ooh. You know, what going was, back to your old house. Exactly. What well, was going to happen mentally? So I had hmm. spent the whole week in my room. TV never went on. My TV never went on one time in my hotel room in Tampa. Spent a lot of time visualizing uh, I read. I'm not a big reader, but I read a lot of stuff. I made sure I stayed busy with my teammates. Um, but I prepared myself to go on that football field and make sure I controlled my thoughts. Think the right thoughts. Think the right thoughts. Think the right thoughts. Well, when I went out there, there was nothing. I had no emotion. I had no no flashbacks. Saw my family, waved at them, saw some familiar faces, had a really good warm-up. Um, but kind of just went, you know, went through the motions, had no juice to me. Yeah. First couple series, I played terrible. I missed Jamal Lewis on a, a little swing route. Stokely on third down I was open. I missed him. Yeah, it was bad. I think I threw one. <laughs> yeah, I threw one out of bounds on a on a deep ball. And uh, Sam Gash comes out to me probably before the third or fourth, probably third series. Former Patriot. One of the great teammates of all time. Uh, nice. Grabs me underneath my breastplate of my shoulder pads. This TV timeout. And starts kind of shaking me and looks me dead in the eyes and says, we need your juice. We thrive on your energy. We thrive on your emotion. Let's go. And it was like a switch went off. And the hair on my arms came up. I recognized, that's right. I'm in the Super Bowl. Let's do this. And I remember he said, uh-huh. I jumped into the huddle, and they all said, okay, he's back. You know, and then the, the, stay true to yourself. I, I wasn't, I had done the opposite. I had tried so hard to make sure I didn't have these negative flashbacks emotionally that I just brought myself down too much and I needed to be snapped back into it. And once I think that's the series I hit Stokely on the touchdown pass and, and that really got me going for the rest of the game. I think it got the guys on offense going too because now they were they're like, okay, he's fine. And if you hadn't if that hadn't worked, then Ray Lewis was going to be the same. Yeah, somebody was going to eventually get my attention. It's like the scene in Airplane where yeah. everybody's waiting in line and the guy's got a baseball bat. Yeah. Um you mentioned uh, Sam Gash as a great teammate. It seemed like that. That was a pretty unique team of characters. Yes. I know we like to say that, like, oh, what a team. That team really was like, because uh, at Hard Knocks a couple years later, most of the guys mm-hmm. were left, not all of them. But what's interesting to me, because I think Ray Lewis is going to be great on TV. Oh, yeah. I don't know if anybody's forwarded that theory, but I think when he's retired and he decides to do TV, he's going to be the guy of, of the next generation. Yes. He'll be very but then good. you have Brian Billick who I feel like is, is totally underrated as a color guy. I love I love when Brian Billick's on. Sarah Gusa. I learned so much. Sarah Gusa will skip over. But, but, <laughs> but a total character. Total character. But why did that? I mean, that had to have been the record for most media guys from one team. Right? Rod Woodson. 
Shannon, oh, Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp, right. Yeah, Six. Right. Yeah, CBS, couple at Fox. That must have um, been a happy uh, beat writer that year for your team. Yeah. For the Baltimore Sun <laughs> or whatever paper. Very smart football guys. Charismatic. Yeah. Um, bold. Um, but, I mean, it, it, it was crazy now. I'm a, I'm a alpha male. I'm a type A as much as you can be. And at times you felt like you had a small personality on that team. Mm. I mean, there's times you're like, dang. You know, I've never in my life not been – the biggest personality in the room. I might yeah. be number ten right. on, the, on this football team. So and who was like the number one? Tony Saragusa, without a doubt. Really, hands wow. down. Wow, not even close. I'm was stunned the, by was that. the ringleader over Ray Lewis? Oh yeah, yeah. You know Ray get and Ray's great. Not saying he, Ray's one of the greatest teammates I've ever had, but really it was Tony, Rod Woodson, Shannon, then Ray. Oh. In terms of the big personalities on that team, and and Rod really, I I, I can't give him enough credit. Rod was the glue of that football team. Ray gets talked about as the most. Rod Woodson was the one um, beyond anybody else that really was the key figure of that football team. How many guys do you need? Do you need like four? I don't. Is there a number you need to hit? If you have less than four, is it bad? Is it... that seems like a glut? Four seems like. Oh, we had other guys too. Rob Burnett was a great leader. Um, like who is the guy in the Redskins? How's his team is the Redskins? Yeah, I, do they have guys like that? The linebacker was like, yeah, what's his uh, name? Fletcher. London Fletcher. Yeah. London Fletcher's that way. I think you need you need a few, um, you, but you need people to be dominant personalities and strong leaders, but also at times be good followers. Yeah, you know, and that was like Ray Lewis for great as leader as he is, he also followed Ray. I mean Shannon and followed Rod. Um, you know, I was a. a, a Dynamic leader, but yet I definitely look to them for leadership. Well, I guess and, Ray was younger that. too at that's, that point. Is yes. that's yeah. right? You had a bunch of guys who'd been around the block a little yes. bit. Yeah, yeah. A lot of been there, done that. A lot of pelts on the wall. Yep. Um, that's what Belichick. Harry Swain. I mean, Harry Swain had been to a couple Super Bowls and was one of our tackles. And Jonathan Ogden's a very domineering personality. He was the left tackle, uh, uh, and we had big, big personalities. Uh, on that football team, but somehow they all just kind of came together, and uh, there's a lot of respect for one another. So, who are those guys in the Packers? <sighs> you know, I <sighs> does it seem like Rodgers is that type of guy? Aaron Aaron's a great leader, yeah. um, and, and that that team really rallies around him. Charles Woodson, um, yeah. you can see that. Never made sense why the Ra- why the Raiders let him go, and then it was like. Packers kind of swooped in. I don't even think they overpaid for him or anything. And I think it's a different era, too, now. I don't know. I'm disconnected a little bit more than I was. You know, I'm three years removed now, so I don't know a lot of the younger guys. I don't know their personality makeups. Um, But it's a a lot more of a collegiate atmosphere in the NFL locker room these days. Uh, You've seen your team, the Patriots, go through it and transition to a lot of young guys that don't necessarily get it all the time. And you kind of got to teach them. On the fly, so I think you you develop those type of leaders over time. And there's no Teddy Bruschi on that team. Right. Tom, it's Tom Brady and some other guys. But when it was Tom and Teddy and Vrabel, I mean that was a oh, the old four Pats unique loaded. group of people yeah. Yeah. of not just players right. of people. Yeah, and I don't think you can you can try to put it together, but uh, it's just different now that you can't pay those year seven, eight, nine guys. Um, Enough, you can get a young guy in there and pay him a lot less and get the special teams benefit, the athletic benefit from him. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned how you didn't have the juice, and then Sam Gash told you to have the juice. Mm -hmm. You kicked in the juice. (laughs) I felt like Brady in that Jets game. I I don't know. I've I've probably watched every game he's ever played. And I think like earlier in the year when they went to Pittsburgh, you could just tell. Something was off. He's got it. He was off in that Jets game. Some, and I don't I, know if his foot was bothering him or his what foot was, was going bothering on. him. Uh, I know that for a fact. Uh, that foot hurt him all year long. Yeah, uh, this guy's tough beyond tough. Uh, you know, before I criticize him, because I will for how he was emotionally in that game. Uh, they're not a tougher guy in this league, than right. Tom Brady. Because he, a lot of guys are tough, but they need to. They need you to know that they're tough. Yeah. To me, that's not as tough as a guy that's so tough. That he doesn't care whether you know or not that he's tough. Does that make sense? Right. Tom's that guy. Um, there was something off. I, I we I saw it during the game, but I didn't want to see it because I'm such a fan too of him. Um, emotionally, it was not the same. He wasn't. He didn't have something. He might have been. The pain might have been too great. I don't know if he was sick. Uh, something was off. And, and to be honest with you, and I, I'll say this to his face when I see him in a couple weeks. 
he did not play very good. I mean, I went back and did the coaching film, and I, I grade a very simple, you know, plus minus S satisfactory grade for quarterbacks yeah. when I'm doing it, getting ready for TV. I gave him 15 minuses. Uh, the most I've ever given him in a grading period is four. I gave him 15. 15 plays that he hurt the team. Uh, I, that just doesn't happen with Tom Brady. I thought he was terrible as I was watching it, so yeah. I'm not and surprised. I, For him, know, he was terrible. I didn't have anything at stake. It was not my team. But he. it looked like he 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 uh, that first series, the juice could be there. There was kind of a crescendo building oh, as yeah, you guys yeah. moved down the field and the, that the interception. Little interception, and that was it. Which people wanted to make an excuse for him that the defensive lineman hand got up, and I went and I watched it on you know the, the coaches from the over. Terrible, and terrible over. pass. He lost control of the ball. It happens to all of us. It doesn't happen yeah. very often. You go as you take the ball back, and you transition for, uh, backwards to forward. He just lost leverage on the ball and lost control of the ball. And I'm wondering, and this is total, spec, total speculation, I'm wondering if in the back of his head he's like, could that happen again? I know I can't turn the ball over against this team. Am I going to lose leverage on the ball again? And uh, was there something that kept him from pulling the trigger a couple times? Because there are plays where branch, well, wide open. There's nobody within 10 yards of, the, of them. And he doesn't throw him the ball. I know the the more I'm thinking about that game as I distance myself from it, I've, I've done the seven stages of grief. <laughs> good, good. Um, and then you see what happened to the Jets the next week, and you think like that fake punt, how stupid it was, and then how bad Brady played in it. And do you not man, think the fake punt would have worked um, if he doesn't bobble the ball? I see. You saw. You probably saw a better angle of it than I did. Merrill, would it, would Mer- it have worked? Merrill and I had a huge discussion. In fact, we brought in like ten PAs, ESPN, and pulled the film up, and without telling them which we thought we had them all judge, would this have worked? Would have not worked? And I lost. It, like. Eight out of ten said it was not going to work. I still think it was going to work. I think they hook Smith. You know what I mean by hook? Because they get outside of him. The play is yeah. designed to go outside. They ran their gunners right to left to clear the coverage. If he if Chung gets outside of Smith, which it looks like he's going to, if he catches it cleanly, I think it's a huge game. That's my personal opinion. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. Merrill thought differently. Well. Whether it worked or not, I still I know it's a little desperate. You're home. It's seven to three. Just go to halftime and get out of there. Yeah. But so and now I'm looking at this Pittsburgh team because I, I I still haven't made my pick yet for my column, and I'm okay. trying to figure out how good this team is. The Baltimore game, third and nineteen, two oh seven left. Roethlisberger makes a great throw. They end up winning the game. But really, Baltimore they still have to be kicking themselves for how that game went. Then the next week, that Jets game. Jets flat, like we talked about earlier. Something missing with them for the first 20 minutes. It starts to come back. If that game goes five quarters, I know it's stupid to say, I think the Jets win that game. It just felt like they were gaining steam and the Steelers were going the other way. Mm -hmm. Are the Steelers the best AFC team? I know they're here, and the whole goal of the game is you get there. But are we going to look back at this after a Packers 20-point blowout and say... I don't think that'll happen. No? I don't think that'll happen. Uh, I think these two teams are very evenly matched. Um, this has been the hardest, you know, I've told you I'm a film geek, so I sit there and I watch the, the tape and probably get swayed too much by the XO. Uh, very hard to find a distinct advantage one team has over the other. Yeah. Um, two very good teams. Are they the best? I, I think when you talk about the best teams, it goes beyond players and schemes. I mean, a lot of it's the, the makeup of the personalities of the team, the chemistry they have. I, I always say this. You and you do the you know, you track every champion. Every champion in sport, when they get up on the podium afterwards and they're asked that question, they never talk about we had better players, we had better scheme. They never say that. They always say we had the best chemistry. We loved one another. We trusted right. one another. Right. They always talk in those terms. Every champion, basketball, baseball, uh, whatever it is, football. So you have to start trying to look through a lot of the the flaws. The flaws yeah. and say, does this team have something special? Both these teams have overcome a lot. I think the Packers have overcome a little bit more. Yeah. You know, losing all these injuries. Not Sitting with Aaron in this interview yesterday, he just kept going back to this team didn't flinch when guys got hurt. They didn't jump off the ship. I mean, he couldn't talk. It wasn't selling me. He doesn't need to sell me. We're buddies. We text. We talk. Yeah. He's not trying to sell me anything. He just was being really looking in me in the eyes when the camera's rolling saying, Trent, you need to understand. There's something really, really special about this team. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. That speaks volumes to me. That's more than the tape. 
to me. Yeah, it presents itself to me uh, like trust. Trust is the word that, that jumps to mind when I see that yeah. and hear you describe it. And, you well, know. I was wondering if maybe the Packers should have been a 15-win team and things got screwed up and they ended up winning 11. But maybe they were the juggernaut. And then you look at the flip side with the Patriots, who were 14-2. and two, They came on late. Maybe they shouldn't have been the juggernaut. Maybe we just, maybe. for whatever reason, the season shook out a certain way. Yeah, the Packers and now order injuries. has been restored. Because yeah. the Patriots were... You know, all, pa- all Pats fans secretly were like, our defense at some point, this yeah. is going to be bad. And, you know, we all these little quick passes, you can have the game where a couple get tipped. And That's what I kept and saying, yeah. We It was never an explosive team, and they can never get quick drives and quick points, things like that. You watch this Packers team, and I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I, I just think they're a dome team that happens to play in Wisconsin. And they're going to be awesome in this Dallas thing. I'm leaning toward Green Bay. I, I like I, I, I I agree with you. I do. I, I got a little tired hearing how much they're built for turf when I also saw them play old school, dirty, grinded out, sure. tough nosed football in bad weather. You, they're way better indoors offensively, but they, they're substantive enough to also win those ugly, mutter games. I, I feel like they are now what folks thought they could be at the beginning of the season. Yep. I mean, they, they were who they were, the Dennis <laughs> Green. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> They right. are who we thought they were or something. I like thought that. that in that Falcons game, I thought they looked a little 9-9 Rams-ish. Oh, yeah. They looked free. Reminded they, me of like that. Just a, the guy, the quick slants and the guys already running a hundred miles an hour. I was yeah. like, and the, the speed. And uh, you know, halfway through the second quarter, I'm thinking, I can't believe it took Atlanta. Like this is going to be a blowout. Not only do they play fast, they make the other team play slow. And I think that's something that fans need to understand is that when you're really good offensively, not only do you play fast, and it's just it's instinctive. It's boom, 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 boom. The other team is on their heels, and they don't play fast. So you're playing super fast, and they're playing with a cluttered mind and thinking and kind of on their heels. That's what the 99 Rams did. That's what yeah. the Saints did at times last year. That's what this team does. I mean, it is in, out, and off. They get in the huddle, they get out of the huddle, and they get off the ball. And you just see these defenses kind of, hey, the first half of the Bears game was a clinic offensively. They were awesome offensively the first half of the Bears. And so, should have closed any through yeah, one bad pass. Exactly. Should have closed. Should have. But I mean, they were. They had. The, they had the Bears spinning. There's on the coaches' tape. You can see Erlacher and Briggs just like looking at you like, what, what was that? What's going on? Yeah. And they made those two who are very good players look silly in the first half of that game. Well, here's my big question for you, Trent Dilfer, quarterback expert. I like when you say my last name. <laughs> I know. Um, you think about Brady and Manning and how they lost and what those defenses did to them. You think about what Rodgers can do and Roethlisberger can do and how these guys can create mm-hmm. four or five plays that shouldn't have happened mm-hmm. by moving around, doing things that I think the old school guys, I would throw Kurt Warner in this group, the days of the quick release, super smart guy, it doesn't seem like that's totally enough anymore. It also seems like you need to make a couple plays. Sure. Do you feel like that's where this game is headed? Josh Freeman. People like that, like just that's the next generation of quarterbacks. You won't see a Brady Manning type. The guy's going to be have to, have to be able to move around. Well, one, there's just better athletes playing quarterback. So I do all the college. I just finished last week doing all the college evals for all these um, players. And just athletically in general, it's so, so much more of an athletic position. I mean, Bla- this Blaine Gabbert, who's 6'5", 240, yeah. he's going to run sub 4'6 in his pro day. Really? He's going to oh, run 4'5'4". He uh a, a, they're just freaks. The, all these guys are, are freaky. So yes, the position has become more athletic. But but please understand this, and this will never ever 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 change in the NFL. It's changed in college. It's only good if you can play the quick release digest information game. Right. Also, it, that's the starting point. So they have to learn how to play the position true to the position. That is, drop back, read defense, deliver the ball on time. Now, if they can do that, and they have this other element, then it's it's a totally different weapon you have a quarterback. But look at Michael Vick, the greatest athlete that's ever played quarterback, and people say he was good in Atlanta. I never thought he was very good in Atlanta. Most quarterback people don't think he was very good in Atlanta. It wasn't until they taught him in Philadelphia, you need to digest information, process it, make a play on time, on rhythm, then you can go do all your stuff if that doesn't work. And he still wasn't that great. He was pretty. He was pretty darn good this year. But <laughs> what do you mean he wasn't that great? What are you talking about? He, the, the Washington Monday Night game threw the whole thing out of whack. It, 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 a lot of us started drinking the Kool Aid a little bit too much after that. But I did see him do some things that were pretty darn amazing. All right.
Well, I watched him lose a playoff game and score 16 points. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Now, I just worry as a Patriot fan, and I think Colts fans should be worried too, is, you know, you watch the way the defenses play these these guys, and they're basically begging Brady to run. We're yes. going to give you this. Take it. And he won't do it. I think and Manning won't either. But that's not really uh, as much a function of, of the type of players Brady and Manning are as they've both been in the league for 10 or 12 years. They're just years. older? Well, the, the teams can, can uh, know their strengths and weaknesses now. But it just seems like if you're Rodgers, you have the advantage of, that team has to be worried that you might take off or tuck it or do whatever. Isn't that like – it's like this extra wrinkle. It is. Have to deal with. You think it's overrated? No, I don't think it's overrated. To be able to extend a play is um, – it's the hardest thing to defense, a quarterback that ex- can extend the play, um, but not necessarily a run. It really yeah. doesn't scare these defensive coordinators and these coaches that much if you can run because they know, okay, maybe they'll scramble for a couple third downs. but. You, Touchdowns come out of the passing game. You know, they come out of explosive plays in the passing game. They come because you march the ball at the passing game. I can go through all the play-by-plays of every touchdown drive this year. I have Joey do this for me often. Almost all the time, the scoring drives where they score touchdowns, every team throws it more than they run it on those drives. Yeah. Now, they might run it in the end zone. They might have some signature runs on those drives, but you throw the ball to get the majority of the yards that end up in touchdown drives. This is his head coaching. Res- he's when he's <laughs> well, head coach. So that's <laughs> not going to change. Throw. So Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, the issue there is what teams now have started to do is they know neither of those teams play great defense either. Yeah. So they just they bend but don't break. They give them the easy completion. They give them the easy completion. But they're going to eliminate a drive or two that Tom and Peyton get when they get the ball. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, so you take really two possessions away from Tom Brady, take two possessions away from Peyton Manning. That's how they've learned to beat him. What you can't do is give up the big play over the top, give him a short possession, then put him back on the field and let him do it again. So that, that's really what teams are doing to those two guys. But both those guys will come out next year and have great years. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm hoping that maybe this will maybe get a different receiver, Brady. We're talking Patriots again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, we I haven't gotten over the Jets loss. <laughs> I, I'm a fan. I had a Red Sox I'm question, totally a so. fan of the Chad Ochocinco, the New England thing. Oh, my if, God. If, if you're pushing it. <laughs> Ask your Redskins question. <laughs> you don't like that. He's really good now. He's, you, he is really good. What are you talking about? He is a very good player, and he, he would he would add a dynamic element to that team, and he'd be fine personality-wise. <laughs> he would wise. definitely be a dynamic element. I feel like after the Moss thing, I'm kind of all set. Diff- well different on the, kind uh, of personalities. You think he's a uh, he's not one of those look at me guys though. No, he's a look and at me guy. This is a guy who. who so was Corey Dillon. Wasn't he, he showed up on Basketball Wives this week. I'm like, hey, really? You're, <laughs> you already have your own VH1 show. Now you're on this show. <laughs> Sorry, Trent, no. I, I, ask your Redskins question. Yeah. You uh, saw a bunch of college quarterbacks, yeah. and I have a team in Washington that's probably yes. in, in the market for a college quarterback. Yes. Yes. Who'd, you, who'd you like? This Blaine Gabbert special. Yeah. He's a unique a thrower. Him a special. Yeah. He, well, I should say, this. please. I look at these guys as prospects, not players. Yeah. So I'm not talking about them as players. I'm talking about prospects. How, if developed right, if given the right situations, how high are their ceilings? Yeah. And that's the easiest way. Blaine Gabbert's ceiling is remarkably high. I mean, he's as gifted as a thrower as I've seen since Drew Bledsoe coming out. Wow. Uh, Sam Bradford was good last year. Pretty darn good. It's not even close in terms of throwing ability between Sam Bradford last year and Blaine Gabbard this year. This guy is uniquely gifted. Andrew Luck? He's, he's not coming. Andrew Luck. I, I understand, he, but he's going to be. He loves Andrew. He, I know. That, that's, a, that's, a whole that's a whole other okay. story. That's a whole other story. With Andrew <laughs> Luck, you actually can talk player. You don't have to talk prospect. Oh. You can say just as a player, yeah. he is phenomenal. But that, that's next year's conversation. All right. Is the there, guy that I really love, the, the hidden jewel in this is Andy Dalton. Um, Locker, talented, Newton, I don't know. I'm going to go to this media workout next week because I need to see it in person. Um, the film is very hard to evaluate because of the type of offense he played in. Um, uh, Greg McElroy is going to be a very good pro, but this Andy Dalton has a very high ceiling, and people aren't talking about it, but he does some things instinctively, uh, talent-wise, his personality fits where you could be ta- – Andy Dalton could be the Aaron Rodgers in this oh. draft. I'll He's a guy that has a lot of just the same kind of stuff. He's he's built emotionally the same way. He's built mentally the same way. And physically, he's gifted the same way. I'll tell you one thing. That's a strong man. 
Great quarterback you know, I love name. my names. Great Andy quarterback Dalton. name. Andy Dalton's a Andy, nice name. And the that red, could be the like red hair action kind of separates star. him. Sounds like a leader. What does he have? Red hair. Flaming red hair. He can like, uh, like bright. No, but it's good. That's like, red hair. It like separates him. Has there been a, a good red hair quarterback? I don't know. That's, I don't know. He could, always, he could shave his head and do the Trent Dilfer. Only so many of us, only so many of us can pull this off. <laughs> How often do you shave that thing? Three times a week. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Do you just wear makeup permanently now because yeah. you're on TV 24-7? Yeah. Do you take it off? No. Sleep in it, wake up, just powder my face. Does Joey just day. spray paint you with the makeup? <laughs> the, the makeup people say they you have... come out of the shower naked, like they, yeah. they just spray, <laughs> spray paint me. you, and then you put a suit on. The makeup people joke they have to order extra buckets of makeup when I'm working because they got to do the whole head. How many hours of football talk are you doing this week? Oh, man, including radio? Yeah. Like 20? Uh, oh, easy. Four a day? When it's all said and done, yeah. Because Sunday I'll do, Sunday alone, four-hour countdown, and then I do, I, I'm the guy that has you guys to do four I have, yeah. I have to do the fill. So when the game ends and oh you turn God. to Sports Center, yeah. it's me and the Bristol anchors. And we do like an hour of fill before then the late Sports Center that I'm on with Levy and Wingo and Chris Carter and uh, Keyshawn. What I don't understand Which goes is how you guys for, don't for 90 up. minutes. But how don't you guys screw up in those and like either say an F-bomb accidentally that's, or that's say a, something yes. offensive? <laughs> like in this culture we live in. I don't know. You got bloggers just dying and don't put it in to my, make a mistake. Don't put it in my hand. Oh, no, no, I, <laughs> always, <laughs> I am always paranoid. Joey will tell you this. I'm not worried about what I'm going to say makes sense because I study and yeah. you might agree with me, not might not agree with me. I am paranoid about saying the wrong. I don't have a very good vocabulary to start with. Get a little punchy. Exactly. It's late at night. Irritable. You, you flew a red so afraid, eye. Yeah, so afraid of Coffee's saying the wrong Coffee's not kicking thing. in. You had a bad cup of coffee. <laughs> yep. That is the, you say, that's the ultimate fear. Well, I will stick up for you if Thank that ever you. happens. Trent Elfer, what, what was your Super Bowl pick, by the way? Packers 23-20. You went under. The under is 44 and a half. I, purposely I think it's under. high scoring. 34 to 28, really? something like that. But I don't know who's going to win it. They're the two best point defenses in the league. I just like them. You just think that's a 16-week aberration? <laughs> big TV, big TV, fast field. I think there's going to be a lot of energy in the building. I think just I think guys flinging it, I, I think feeling it. Everybody's talking about what quarterback plays best. I think it's the quarterback that doesn't make the mistakes. I think oh. this will come down. I think there will be some sloppy play in this game. The defenses will force it. But I think there'll be some sloppy offensive play. And I think the quarterback that is, protects the ball the most. We're talking fumbles, you know, interceptions, just doesn't give the other team anything. Do you like Ag- Aguilera over or under for 154? What? National anthem. National oh, anthem. was that the over under? Yeah. Over. Brave, six seconds? Will she hold Brave yeah, for more than six you. seconds? Right. I think that's the right number, actually. Oh, you think a push? Yeah. Gatorade color, any opinion? No, uh-uh. Nothing? Nothing? Yellow? Clear? Clear. Coin flip? Heads. Heads? There's been a lot of action on tails this week. Really? 55% of the action's on tails. Really? Yeah. I always go heads. Trent Dilfer, we will see you on 45,000 <laughs> yes, other ESP mediums. Thanks for coming to the BS Report. It's People pleasure, love the last man. one, so love it's fun. It. Let's do it again. All right. That's great. All right. We will see you tomorrow. We'll be taping from uh, the Addy House in Dallas, I guess. And we don't have a guest yet. i got to find one. Maybe tonight at a party we'll grab one. Anyway, Trent Dilfer, thank you. So I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.